the G20 is coming soon. And one thing we know for sure, there will be very few women's voices as leaders at this G20 in Italy on the 30th and 31st of October. Leading up to that, I want to give young women an opportunity to talk about gender inequality and their experiences in their quest for gender equality. So please listen in and then pay attention to what's happening at the G20 and keep asking the question, where are the women? Good day, bonjour Tanzi. I'm Senator Mary Lou McFedrin, and today I'm going to be speaking with three youth leaders that participated in the UN Generation Equality Forum that concluded in Paris on July 2nd. There were more than 50,000 people who were able to participate in this forum because it followed a hybrid format. And of those 50,000 people participating, many of them uh, could be identified as youth and youth leaders from more than uh, 90 countries around the world. Out of this forum, we really had something that I've never seen as a uh, an activist for decades on women's and girls' rights. And that is a focus and a promise of $40 billion in funding from governments and from the private sector, including foundations, to build a five-year action plan to try to achieve gender equality in our world by 2026. Now this makes for an interesting comparison to the sustainable development goals where we're midway through that period and they are supposed to be attained by 2030. So we have a very short timeline. And as I speak from Canada, we have in numerous provinces, including my home province of Manitoba, severe climate emergency warnings in place. And so the overall context of the range of experiences with this forum is something that I really wanted to be able to explore on this podcast today. I am going to thank, to begin, Felicia Baldner, who's a member of the Canadian Council of Young Feminists, my youth advisory. And I, I hope it's okay, Felicia, to ask you when you're in your brief introduction in a moment, just to share uh, your age or your age range. <laughs> um, you are one of, I think, one of my youngest youth advisors and um, very much value the input that you bring to the process. And also joining me are two law students We've been so fortunate in my office to have our team joined by Isis uh, and um, Isis Hart and Anne Fontan, um, both from the University of Ottawa Law, and um, have been involved with a number of projects that we're working on in my Senate office, and both of whom were able to participate in the Gender Equality Forum. So I think we have actually already, we're going to be sure we can hear some quite different perspectives. So let me begin. I'm going to begin with you, Felicia, and um, just ask you for a, a bit of a description about your involvement in the forum and something that stood out for you in your experience. For sure. Thank you for the introduction, Senator McFedrin. Um, one thing that stood out for me was the commitments made because you've never seen such um, such an event where people from all over the world, um, from the private sector, from the political standpoint, are all brought together to discuss one issue, gender equality. And over $40 billion with a structured plan, that's an amazing outcome, which I find. Um, and I myself made a commitment along with many of my fellow peers. Um, and one of the things that I was participating 
participated in um, was the opening ceremony where you see mm. from Kamala Harris, where you see um, Hillary Clinton and um, I'm sorry, I, I might pronounce her name wrong, Julieta Martinez having an intergenerational dialogue on climate change along with various issues. So just that image itself, it's so powerful. Um, and yes, once again, thank you for the introduction. I am one of your youngest um, <laughs> advisors. I am 15 years old. I recently just turned 15. Um, I am in Manitoba too, just like Senator, uh, Senator McFedrin. Um, and I'll pass it along. Thanks very much, Felicia. Um, Isis, I'm wondering if you could share with us something that stands out for you in your participation in the forum. Sure, thank you for that introduction. Um, so as a part of, um, as you said, Anne and I are uh, legal interns at Senator McFedrin's office. And so um, we were able to kind of choose which action coalition we wanted to focus on and attend the meetings for. And an area of interest to me has always been uh, reproductive health rights and bodily autonomy. And so I got to attend a number of these sessions. Um, what stood out the most to me uh, was definitely the focus on education um, and sexual reproductive health education specifically. Um, it's not something that uh, in my experience is talked about often enough, especially when talking about reproductive rights, because education is really, uh, it's, it's not a measure that you can do to increase access. And it's not something that you can place, you know, a label on and say, we're doing this, but education is the key to bodily autonomy, I believe. And I really was excited to hear those conversations and, um, those investments as well into those initiatives. And uh, I hope that Canada is a part of that because I think um, our education system could really use those kinds of initiatives. And I know in my experience, bodily autonomy was not something I learned about until post-secondary. And I really hope that's something we can change for our youth. Um, it would have really shaped me as a young woman and it unfortunately came a bit later so I hope we can get on to that and that was definitely my number one takeaway for sure. Thanks Isis you're causing me to remember that um, when I was a law student it was actually illegal for me to go to a health service and ask for birth control so um there, you know, there are some changes in this area. And one of the big issues that you've identified is the information and the knowledge that actually allows young women to make the decision for themselves as to what it is they need for their sexual and reproductive health. So thank you for that. Anne, tell us a little bit about uh, what caught your attention? What did you decide to participate in at the Generation Equality Forum? I was very excited to attend the Gender-Based uh, Violence Action Coalition. Having done a little bit of research on human trafficking and the context around the Truth and Reconciliation Commission and Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women and Girls report um, during my time at the office, I was interested to learn more on gender-based violence issues that affect women not only in Canada, but as well as the rest of the world, and to hopefully learn from the discussions uh, on what we could do as an international community to help uh, women everywhere. Um, so I'd say my main takeaway was how important it is to give a voice to women. And from the discussions, I learned that how we can achieve that is by supporting and funding grassroots organizations as well as women-led organizations. Uh, because they are the ones who are present on the ground and uh, as first responders, they are often in the best position to find solutions to the problem. Uh, so the answer from the various stakeholders who attended this action coalition was pretty 
unanimous, uh, we need to increase funding for women-led organizations uh, so that they can have the capital that will enable them to act. Uh, so there was a pretty clear consensus that it's time we put women and girls at the cent center of strategies and interventions. So that was my main takeaway. Thank you. Um, so nothing's perfect. Um, on one hand, this was an astonishing accomplishment and uh, credit due to the governments of Mexico and France for stepping up and for being so engaged and for hosting the preparatory meeting in Mexico and then the forum itself in, in Paris. And this $40 billion commitment is unprecedented. That's a great thing also. And the fact that there's a very specific five-year action plan is something that I think we can be uh, feeling optimistic about. Having said that, I'm wondering if you finished your participation um, in the forum and whether there were any lingering questions, concerns, wishes that you had coming out of that. And um, let me ask uh, you, Felicia, if there are any thoughts you want to share with us on that. Thank you, Senator. Um, I feel regarding how you mentioned the access point of the forum where you had 50,000 participants on this platform, which is which is more than anticipated, which is more than you will ever be able to have in person. While one of the issues I faced was actually accessing the platform. Um, and I believe other youth peers who mm. registered along with me face the same problem so we had we faced that barrier and especially with you know youth who have youth and people who have poor internet connection um and mm. weren't able to access the platform on the first day that that itself i feel was a restriction like i mentioned previously i watched the opening ceremony but i wasn't able to watch it on the platform i was um watching it on the youtube live live stream so on that first day, I actually missed out on quite a lot because my, I had email registration problems and I was communicating back and forth with the tech help at the Generation Equality Forum. And they sent out an email that lots of people are facing the same problem. So I feel that was certainly a restriction. Um, but unfortunately, that problem for me, um, my personal experience was resolved for the second day um, and I wasn't able to engage more. Uh, but yeah, and I feel that, you know, in terms of especially what stood out to me was that the interconnectedness of issues, for instance, I was engaging in the women's economic rights sector. And one thing I picked up on is, you know, during the pandemic or as a shadow pandemic, where lots of women were, you know, at home with their abusers, one mm standpoint of abuse we don't recognize is financial abuse where one partner has control over the financial decisions and that ties into women's economic um, rights where they're not able to be financially independent and the thing about the generation equality forum is that it's a worldwide forum you meet women from all around the world who face this problem and how they've addressed it so I learned about the interconnectedness of these issues and how one impacts the other and that's an interesting point, because for some of the participants, I actually heard them mention um, that they were able to participate because they were able to get to a private place. And they weren't, they would not have been able to participate if they had to actually travel and physically attend. So this is raising an interesting question about, you know, is, is this going to become part of our new normal? Are we going to need to plan for gatherings that allow for hybrid participation? And rather than seeing this as something unusual that's going to disappear when uh, we finally move beyond this, the grip this pandemic has on the world, 
is there in fact something we've learned about being able to bring more numbers together and provide more ranges of options for participation? Um, and I think that's very much under discussion in a, a lot of different places. Um, Isis, tell me a little bit about um, thoughts, concerns, hopes that um, may have been generated by your experience at the forum. Uh, yeah, I definitely, um, to echo those thoughts about the hybrid platform, I think um, that will be really interesting to see going forward, because certainly uh, this is not something I would have attended had it not had this um, the option of attending virtually. And so I think that that is a great thing to take going forward. But of course, as Felicia's mentioned, you have those technical issues and then you end up getting those barriers as well. But I think that we're still learning about those and working through them. So I'm excited to see where that takes us. Um, in terms of the sessions I attended, I think one concern that I came away with, so I attended about four sessions on um, bodily autonomy and reproductive rights. And I was surprised that there was never a conversation about the uh, culture around women's um, reproductive rights. Um, I personally don't think we can talk about reproductive rights without acknowledging how mm. much of a impact culture has on women's access to those rights. Um, certainly we know religion is a large component, but it's not the only one. Um, there are certainly people who, because of misunderstanding, they don't believe that women should have that autonomy over their bodies and the right to choose what they want to do with their bodies. And I was surprised it didn't come up just in terms of, you know, you can invest funding and you can create better access and better programs. But if you don't have that culture change where you open conversations, I mean, in my own education background, one of the biggest things we talked about when talking about autonomy was the fact that women don't talk about abortions. And, you know, it's the kind of thing where if you look at the statistics, you could have a room full of women and one in three or one in five might have had an abortion and none of them would talk about it amongst themselves because it's still this taboo thing, but it's a really, really transformative experience that women need to be sharing with one another and to be open to talking about. And that's so key to all of these other initiatives. And so I was a little disappointed that that didn't come into play. And I think to, for youth, especially, that's something that needs to be done more so that young women know that these are things they can talk about openly. And to change that culture to create those spaces is, is a, an important step. So that was kind of the biggest concern for me, I think, that I took away from. Well, and you're making that comment, Isis, um, as in a Canadian context, it's it's disconcerting to realize that um, while we do have full reproductive choice in protected in law in Canada, we don't have genuine reproductive choice in many parts of the country because the services are not made available. And in addition to that, while we have a federal, a Canada Health Act, which gives authority to the federal government to withhold funding from provinces that refuse to deliver the full range of legally um, required reproductive health services, including abortion, that, uh, that lever is not used. And right now in the province of New Brunswick, for example, the clinic that was serving people, uh, serving women who were needing to make that choice and needing that service, entirely legal, had to shut down. And the uh, capacity of the federal government to have stepped in and used its authority was left alone. It, it wasn't mobilized. And I think when you mentioned young women, um, I mean, the truth of the matter is that this is an active life issue for women um, from their teenage years through to, roughly speaking, the end of their 40s. That's a big chunk of Canadian society. And to have this kind of um, 
diminishing of the importance of this right so that hospitals and, uh, and governments can actually get away with not providing it is, I think, uh, an issue that um, all women, all people in Canada who believe in rights need to be concerned about. But the truth of the matter is, this is probably a mobilization issue primarily for those of you on the call and, and folks that are um, a few years beyond your, your age. Um, I'll always stand in solidarity with you on this issue. But in many ways, the time for the, the activism has really moved to, to your generations. And from your experience, tell me a little bit about your uh, any thoughts or concerns or wishes that you took away from from what you attended. So during the events I attended on gender based violence, a recurring theme was the importance of applying an intersectional approach. But I, I would have liked to dig a little bit deeper into this subject and really have a discussion uh, maybe on how, uh, for example, women of color are more affected uh, by gender-based violence, um, LGBTQ plus people and trans women are more vulnerable to violence, or how indigenous women and girls are more affected. And uh, more specifically also, uh, a subject I would have liked to hear more about is the increased vulnerability of women and girls during situations of conflict. Um, it was mentioned briefly uh, that women and girls are being victimized in situations of war and conflict, um, that they are being targeted. But learning more on how corruption and conflict increases women and girls' vulnerability is something I would have liked to hear more about. Uh, of course, gender-based violence uh, affects women and girls around the world. Um, like I mentioned, this is amplified in situations of conflict, but it would have been interesting to learn how interventions and solutions can be adapted to women in these difficult situations. So that is one wish uh, I would have liked to see during the forum. Those are, are really good points. Thank you. Um, we've reached the point where we're going to start to wrap up. And in order to do that, I'm going to ask each of you to focus on going forward. Uh, what is it coming out of the Generation Equality Forum with, with uh, a five-year action plan that was articulated and $40 billion in funding that was promised. Of course, we know there's a difference often between what's promised and what's actually delivered, but we'll go with that number at this point. It's just a, a, a few days since the forum has, has finished. And um, just tell me a little bit about what you want the future to look like and whether there's specific action that makes sense to you to be taken either on a personal level or on a larger scale. And, and for that, um, Isis, I'm gonna ask you, please. Um, thank you. I think going forward for me, um, I would like to see that money that's been promised be, uh, I guess, including women's voices in the uh, in deciding where that money is invested and the programs that it's invested mm -hmm. into and ensuring that those voices are at the front of those initiatives um, and that ensuring there's that a part of that money I think needs to go towards research. I think women's health is extremely under-researched um, in a lot of capacities, and that can be really important for any of the action coalitions. If you look at them, all of that, I think, can be connected from climate change to, um, you know, domestic abuse, sexual violence, bodily autonomy, all those things can be connected to women's health. And I would love to see um, those kinds of initiatives really put forward. And I guess trying to make sure that all of these actions can be connected and how to connect them through these initiatives will be important. Uh, yeah. oh, so intergenerational, intersectional, and uh, direct engagement with um, folks that are living the reality every day on the front lines of our society. Thank you for that. And 
Um, what are your thoughts on moving forward and any specific action that's making sense to you as a result of um, what you may have been thinking about and your participation in the forum? Uh, I think prevention is, is really important. Um, and as well as continuing to engage uh, men and boys as well in all gender initiatives. I think that's really important but because it's, uh, it's everybody's job to, to help and advance gender equality. So not forget to engage uh, everyone. Good point that um, it's not only intergenerational and intersectional, but it can't be put into a, any kind of a gender ghetto, that um, these are actions that benefit not only our communities, our families, but the truth is it's an investment in our world. Yeah, thank you for that. And finally, Felicia, um, tell me a little bit about what you were thinking as you wrapped up your experience at the forum and what kind of takeaway you're moving ahead with from that experience. For sure. Thank you, Senator. Um, I feel like, you know, as a young woman, more, I want to see more women involved in STEM fields. And one specific commitment I would like to highlight is when the government of Bangladesh pledged to increase women's participation in the ICT sector. And that includes tech startups and e-commerce um, to 25% by 2026. And I feel, you know, as a 15 year old, and I, when I see women in leadership roles, that empowers me. And, you know, one of the action coalitions, which was um, women's economic empowerment and rights, as, a, as, you know, as a young person growing up, knowing about this, it, it significantly, significantly um, ex, um, influences my choices and what I decide to pursue in the future. Thanks, Felicia. Um, I think part of what you're really stressing there is the uh, digital divide that um, is an issue in Canada, particularly for people that are living in remote areas, I would say particularly in the north of our country, the northern coastline of our, of our country, and that we, we often forget that technology is a wonderful tool, but it also can very quickly be used to undermine people. And that, that really ties in with our whole discussion about a generation equality because the equality we're talking about is rights. And access to services is a very big part of that. So I want to say a big thank you, merci Miigwitch, to Anne Fontaine, to Isis Hatt, and Felicia Baldner for being with me today to have this discussion about what the Gender Equality Forum, Generation Equality Forum, really meant to each of you as individual young women leaders and what you think it means to our world. And with that, I want to wish everyone safety and health and uh, hope that these very difficult days for Canada and the rest of the world as a result of climate disasters that we understand that this is something we can only do by making major changes together. Bye for now. <laughs>